realized I forgot my microphone. I'll get it in just a minute. <laughs> I'll talk loud and two then. Yeah, thank you. Uh, happy 4th. Hopefully everybody got their water on the way in this morning. I wanted to make sure we had ice water. It's supposed to be 99 today, so uh, yeah, make sure to grab an ice water. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone here this morning. Glad we survived last night. I know it was noisy for a lot of folks. and. Uh, we want to uh, continue to give thanks for our freedom this morning and celebrate our, uh, our nation. And so after service, we're having watermelon and hot dogs. And it's kind of the American food, I think. The hot dog, you know, a lot of grilling and, and baked beans. Oh, we got baked beans too. I didn't see those. Okay. Kind of the American uh, 4th of July meal, kind of picnic fair. Uh, we will also be celebrating uh, our communion meal this morning, a different kind of freedom meal freeing us from sin and nourishing us for our faith, nourishing us for our ch the challenges of this week so that we would be strong and filled with God's goodness. We're gathered to remember that when we're feeling overwhelmed, and this has been a tough week, just given the heat, I think it wears us down a little bit. I've noticed in our house, tempers are a little shorter. You know, fuses are a little shorter that way. And I think that's the way for a lot of folks. The checkers at the checkout stand were saying, everybody's feeling the heat. And we don't always act like we should. And we know that. But we're, it's good that we can come back here to this place and say, God, help us to do better. Give us a fresh start. And help us to be more the people that you created us to be. So we begin our service by recognizing our imperfections and asking for God's grace and forgiveness this day. Please rise and join me on page three of your worship folder. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the creator of wind and rain, field and ocean, the bread of life coming down from above, the power at work within us and this world. Amen. Before God and in the company of our sisters and brothers, let us confess our sin. Take a moment to consider those things for which you need to ask God's grace this day. God and Father of all, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have thought better of ourselves than others. We have told lies and hurtful things, acted in ways we wish we could take back, and looked the other way when the action was needed. In your mercy, O oh God, forgive us, cleanse us, and heal us. For the sake of Jesus our Savior. Amen. If anyone is in Christ. There is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. In Christ, you are a new creation. Your sins are taken away and you are made new. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the refining fire of the Holy Spirit, and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, be with you all. And also with you. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among his uh, villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. 
profane place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the gospel of the Lord. That's grace, mercy, and peace to you on this day through Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A little bit of background about this text before we get too far. I think it's interesting that our passage today falls at the end of a section of miracles. Jesus has already begun to perform some miracles. And uh, it's amazing, I think, that people don't recognize him. Even those closest still to him still have a hard time understanding who he is. In fact, maybe it's because they're close to him that they have a hard time hearing him or understanding the change that has taken place, that he was baptized and anointed by God for special work. He was blessed and began his public ministry. He started doing amazing things, and they thought, no, we know that guy. He doesn't do amazing things. That's not him. Even his disciples, after the first miracle, they said, who then is this that even the wind and the sea should obey him? Jesus just took a hurricane and made it calm, uh, totally calm, and they're like, huh. That's weird. Really? I've always assumed that the disciples followed Jesus because they understood who he was. Those fishermen, they dropped their nets, they left their boats, not because they hated fishing. Maybe it was. But I always thought it was because Jesus came along and called to them. And in that invitation, they could recognize that he was different, that the power of God was present there. So I would have expected that when Jesus started performing these miracles, they go, ha, see, there it is, I knew it, I knew this was going to happen. But that's not what was going on. They didn't recognize that. They couldn't see it. It was fairly common for great teachers to pass through, to travel from village to village, great rabbis, and the people would uh, follow. They would have students, they would have followers, they would have disciples. So it's not uncommon for this, uh, this practice that people would drop their work for a time and follow a great teacher. But maybe that's all they understood Jesus to be initially. Maybe when the disciples began following Jesus, they thought, hey, here's a good rabbi, we'll follow him for a little bit. Why not? They didn't necessarily know he was the Messiah. And then the people of his hometown, I think it's great. Uh, wait a minute, that's the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and the sisters. Do you ever think about Jesus being the oldest in a huge family? What were Jesus' siblings like? Now, were they full siblings or half siblings? How does that work? All these weird questions that come out when you start actually thinking about the text. But all these siblings, and they don't understand his power. We heard that lesson recently about how his own, his own family was trying to stop him from performing miracles. Ah, Jesus, no, no. Just leave them. Come in and have dinner. They were more worried about the family dinner than about the healing. That he has Maybe it's this pre-existing knowledge, this pre-existing relationship that makes it hard. My wife's not here today, so I can pick on her. It reminds me of uh, her, re her relationship with her brothers. I think most families are like this, that no matter how old you get, there's still some of that, that uh, juvenile relationship. I don't know. They're still like they're in grade school. They still pick on each other. and They're all adults now, and I'm like... What are you guys doing? You're being goofy. And I've seen this in, in plenty of families. I think most families are like this. My brother and I do it too. We'll pick on each other like we're still in school. And it's that previous relationship, that pre-existing understanding of one another that makes it hard to recognize when we begin to change. And Jesus had clearly changed the way that he was moving through the world. He was no longer simply a carpenter. He was now fully God-made flesh performing miracles, bringing healing that no one else could. And increasingly in the Gospel of Mark, those who reject Jesus are those who are closest to him. It starts with the Pharisees and the Herodians. Those are the, uh, the Jewish religious official people. Jesus would have grown up going to temple and synagogue and learning the Jewish laws. He was a devout Jew. He followed those laws. He started reinterpreting a few of them, and that's what got him in trouble. But he was a devout Jew. He was doing his best to follow those, those laws and those customs. And it was his very teachers that started to have the problem with him initially. 
that rejected him and said, no, nope, no, nope, he's reinterpreting. We didn't give him authority to do that. He shouldn't be doing that. They rejected him and couldn't recognize him as the Messiah. And then the people of his hometown and his own family, and of course the disciples, with a classic one being Peter. When Jesus is put on the cross, Peter says, Jesus, who now? Uh, oh, that guy on the cross? Yeah, I, I don't know him. Um, his own closest followers, his own students, reject him. It's, uh, I think it's interesting to note there are, there are other uh, historical accounts of the day outside of Scripture. A lot of what uh, Christians understand of that period is through Scripture, but there were other historians. One of them was uh, named Celsus, and he was a non-Christian philosopher. And he was writing about uh, 150, 180 in that time frame. So that would have been the early church. That would have been the time of the martyrs. Christians were losing their lives for the sake of their faith. They were being thrown to the lions, torn apart, you know, these awful, awful things. It was very, very hard to be a Christian in those days. And Celsus wrote that the great offense of the Christian faith is not the claim that Jesus was born of a virgin or that God could become flesh. Those things are perfectly fine. He says the great offense of the Christian faith is that Jesus was born to one of the lower class. Classism. Interesting little window into the time period. How the different classes, the wealthy elite, we, I think a lot of us are aware of the Hindu caste system with the, the Brahmins, the priests up top, and the untouchables at the bottom. They're actually called untouchable. People who are so unholy, so unworthy, that you shouldn't go near them. That classism. Do we have classism today? Hmm. That was one of the reasons people had a hard time recognizing Christianity. In fact, even in our text, that, that son of Mary, that is a way of keeping Jesus at a distance. Calling him son of Mary was an insult. He was the son of Mary, but traditionally, uh, you'd be reported to be the son of the father. So he should have been Jesus or Joseph. But he wasn't Joseph's son. He was God's son and Mary's son. So it's a way of pointing out his illegitimacy. Jesus, son of Mary. We're going to keep him at a distance. We do that. We keep each other at a distance. We have these defense mechanisms. And even our gospel lesson today is recognizing that. With Jesus, son of Mary. Sending out the disciples two by two is uh, another uh, reference in our text. And there are a couple reasons this may have been, uh, that Jesus may have done this. One is just safety. It's just a practical reason. I know people that don't like to walk in Portland alone. I think Portland isn't that awful, but, you know, it's a big town, and you never know what you're going to run into. So going two by two is a little safer. And we've all heard the story of the Good Samaritan. The guy's walking down the road, and he gets jumped by thieves. He gets mugged. Maybe if he had somebody with him, that wouldn't have happened. Going with a partner is just flat out safer. It's the wise thing to do. But in Jewish custom, in Jewish law, uh, it's important to have somebody agree with your testimony. If you say you've seen something, that's your report. But if you have a witness to corroborate your story, well, now, it's, now you've got something worth listening to. So Jesus sent them out two by two so that one person could say, I've seen Jesus perform miracles. He is the Messiah. Here to save us. God has become flesh in order to love us, to forgive us, to redeem us, to reunite us with God. Because our brokenness, our human nature gets in the way, our sinfulness gets in the way. But God has come to rescue us. And people listen to this, well, so you could just be making this all up. But now another person steps up and says, I have seen it too. I've seen him calm the storm. I've seen him have power over dark spirits. I've seen him multiply food so that huge crowds could be fed, could be nourished and fulfilled. Oh, you both saw this. Really? So you must not be making it up. You're, you saw it too. Okay, well, wow. Now we got something worth listening to. So where do we go with this text? What does it mean to us? I was thinking about a funeral I went to not long ago, a memorial service, and uh, for a guy named Keith. And Keith was a, uh, a teacher in Portland, uh, Southeast Portland. And like a lot of people in Southeast Portland, 
kind of anti-traditional religion. So I was interested how this memorial service was going to go. And uh, I didn't personally know Keith, but I, I knew somebody who, was, uh, who had known him and was invited to the memorial service. Well, because he was a teacher at a grade school, um, it was held at the school. A lot of his uh, students and parents were going were gonna to be there. And so they held it at the school. Now, this was an interesting thing. I, just a professional curiosity. Without the traditions and the rituals that our faith offers to help memorialize an individual, what do people do at a, at a funeral? What do people do at a memorial? Well, this was fascinating. A lot of thought was put into it. And a, a lot of borrowed traditions from around the world, international traditions. First thing, before you even get to the building, was drumming. Like these big taiko drums, boom, 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 big, huge, loud drums just beating away, and you're blocks away, you know, you can't get anywhere near the school, there's so many people that have, have come to the service. You're walking, and you're like, that's weird, there's drumming, and you realize as you're walking, it's, you're walking toward the drumming. You're walking so, towards some crazy drum circle, Portland. <laughs> you walk into the auditorium, and the walls are covered with these gorgeous tapestries from around the world, these fabrics that are just colorful and vibrant. An amazing experience. Now, Keith was a dance teacher at this art magnet school. And so all the students were required to take visual arts, like painting and drawing, uh, a music class, and a dance class. And so Keith was one of the dance teachers. And so a number of his students performed in his memory. And there was some interesting one. The, a uh, college student had come home from college to perform, and she said that Keith taught her how to dance. She didn't have any interest in dance previous to this. But because of his passion, she was now dedicating her life to it. Beautiful dancer. A little girl. She was eight years old. She got up, no instruments or anything around her, just got up on stage by herself with a microphone, an a cappella, sang a beautiful song that she said Keith had taught her. I thought, I don't know many adults that would stand up with a microphone in front of 500 plus people and sing a cappella. That kid's got guts. Keith gave her confidence. There were a number of other people that spoke, and uh, the last person to speak was the principal of the school. And he said Keith was probably best known for something that he said at the end of every class. He said, now it's yours. Before the students left the room, he would say to them, now it's yours. It may not be perfect. It may change. Do your best with it. Now it's yours. It came to mind today because I think that's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. And that's what he's doing today with us. He's saying, now it's yours. I give it to you to take out into the world. It may not be perfect. It may change. Do your best with it. Now it's yours. Jesus has entrusted to us the work of bringing light and hope into this world. And if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. He says to us today that it is ours to bring out, to fulfill. And so really the question this week is how we will practice that dance. It may not be perfect. It may shift and change. And it should, given our circumstances, given the people that we're talking to, given the, the neighbors that happen to live next to us, given this, the work that we do, it's going to look a little bit different for each of us, how we do this work. But God says to you today, now it's yours. may change, may not be perfect. Do your best with it. Don't go alone. Go with a partner. Take somebody with you. May God bless you this week in bringing this healing, this hope, this joy more fully into our